let me welcome you all very warmly to uh, an event sponsored by the Middle East Institute and made possible by the uh, Lewis R. Hughes Lecture Series. I'd like to, uh, in fact, uh, acknowledge uh, Mr. Hughes, he's a board member in the yellow tie, who has spent uh, uh, time in, in his very successful career giving back to his country uh, in Kabul, uh, working on the development of Afghanistan in the early days after, after the fall of the Taliban. And he continues to give to this issue because it's important to him as it's important to the Middle East Institute and to all of us who are here today. And I think all of us here today can be very, uh, feel very fortunate, that, or feel very um, <clears throat> pleased that the election uh, so far is proceeding as well as it is. It's a surprise and I think it's a testament to uh, the Afghans themselves. We have a, um, our moderator today is uh, Dr. Marvin Weinbaum. He is the director of the Pakistan Center at the Middle East Institute. Uh, Marvin has uh, is a true expert in this area. He uh, was a longtime professor at the uh, University of Illinois. He worked at the Intelligence Bureau at the Department of State where I met him uh, over 15 years ago. And he has been in retirement at the Middle East Institute and he'll be moderating. <laughs> <laughs> hardly retirement, okay. Some retirement. Any, anybody as active as Marvin is hardly retired. Uh, but he will be moderating a very distinguished panel today and I'm going to let Marvin introduce uh, panel members. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Wendy. Uh, uh, welcome. And, uh, you know, the airlines often say when you fly, you know, we know you could have flown on other airlines, but we're pleased that you chose us. You know, there are some five or six events going on at this very moment. And over the last two days, I counted eight or nine, which were relevant in one way or another. Perhaps some of you have uh, have attended. This is this may be your second or third event, uh, but uh, so we we're pleased that you're with us, and and we know why you're with us because we've got such a superb panel. Uh, no, it's not it's not the light the light lunch. <laughs> uh, we're going to use a format that we've used before here, and rather than having serial presentations by the by the panelists we're going to uh, we're going to have a series of questions in which I'm going to ask them to respond to uh, and so that we'll have a more interactive approach because um, I, I really believe that it's the collective wisdom here that we have on this uh, dais here today which really makes this so very special uh, <clears throat> Amano Gilzai, to my right here, as a long-term journalist and been with BBC, and uh, i just very impressed uh, meeting with him and his depth of understanding of uh, both Pakistan and Afghanistan. And, and Ali Jalali, uh, known to most of you here, being a major figure in Afghan political affairs, former Minister of Interior, uh, Currently at the uh, at the National Defense University here in Washington, where he's a distinguished professor, and I understand now he has a book coming out shortly, uh, uh, which covers a couple of thousand years of military history. So I commend that to you. It's it's not yet available, is, is it, Ali? Uh, Ali, it's it's okay, July. July. Okay, so uh, those of you who are Afghan buffs here will certainly want to read something about, especially this military dimension, which is often so neglected. Omar Samad, <coughs> to Ali's right, again, has become a very, very well-known figure here in Washington. Uh, uh, Omar, former ambassador to Canada and France, uh, uh, advisor to Hamid Karzai. Uh, uh, Ali's... Uh, is with the New America Foundation now. He's been with USIP. Uh, and if you read his, his Twitters and blogs, you know that there's nobody who is, 
who is more responsive to what's going on today than, than Ali in terms of, uh, of just good advice. Omar. Sorry? Omar. Omar. Oh, did I say, oh, I'm sorry, Omar, did I say, oh. we can share. one too many Ali, <laughs> one, too, one too many Ali, sorry, oh, Omar, uh, of course, thank you, <laughs> and Andrew Wilder, um, Andrew's been uh, a participant, observer of events in Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, and uh, we go back at least 25 years uh, in knowing one another, uh, and uh, there are few people who have the kind of depth of understanding uh, of both those countries and who are uh, so regularly, uh, were so regularly dependent on. Uh, 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 <clears throat> Andrew is currently heading up the South Asian program at uh, USIP. Uh, and has just recently, as has uh, Ali Jalali, just recently returned from Afghanistan. So we have at least two here who are uh, able to give us firsthand accounts of what has occurred in the last few weeks. So uh, with, with that out of the way, um, gentlemen, <clears throat> this election has riveted international attention uh, in a way that uh, we've seen few elections do in the uh, in the recent in recent past uh, what is it that is so critical about this election uh, particularly for for the future of Afghanistan who'd like to start us off on that Ali thank you Marlene. thank you for inviting me and uh, you want to bring your mics down to perhaps at a level and uh, pleased to share panels with uh, old friends uh, well I think this is a question that uh, is on the mind of everybody not only in Afghanistan but elsewhere Afghanistan is in transition transition is the catch word in Afghanistan transition political transition economic transition and security transition and in this transition, political transition is the mother of all transitions. If there is a smooth political transition, I think it can help other transitions, despite the fact that international attention has been mostly focused on security transition. But without uh, a kind of a smooth political transition, effective political transition, I don't think security transition will be as good as one can expect. So in this political transition, the election election is the key. So therefore, I think everybody inside Afghanistan is looking forward to this election. Because I asked many people in Kabul just recently, why you are so enthusiastic about this election? They, they said two things to me. And I'm sure uh, Andrew um, have heard the same thing. That first, that is a hope that all uh, front runners pledge that the first thing that they will do if they are get elected to sign BSA, bilateral security agreement, which many people believe that it is not only because that will allow the presence of international forces in Afghanistan, but it cannot it create more political, economic, and security uh, improvements in Afghanistan. At the same time, it can give a strong message to the uh, Taliban and also to Pakistan that the Afghan is not going to be abandoned, Afghanistan will not be abandoned. And there is, I always said that when they talk about reconciliation in Afghanistan, I always believe that unless something happens inside Afghanistan, it will be very difficult to draw people from outside for reconciliation. <clears throat> Therefore, there should be some sort of hope for stability in Afghanistan that will encourage the neighbors of Afghanistan and the Taliban to come to the negotiating table. And this is one of the, um, the reasons. The other thing is that the, this election is different from the election in the past when incumbents was running and everybody thought that there will be a lot of, uh, you know, attempts to use the government machinery apparatus in, in, in support of the incumbent. This is a different. On the other hand, Afghanistan society is different. 
Even that generation today is different from the one, I mean the uh, voting generation is different from 2009 and 2004. You have a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, probably uh, uh, desire to, to participate and change the country through political process. Omar? Uh, I agree, and in, in following up on what Minister Jalali said, um, I would like to add a few other elements here. And first of all, it also signifies the end of an era. And this is the so-called Karzai era, mm -hmm. the post-Bond, post-2001 era. And it also, if you look at the whole process over the last few months and even a couple of years since electioneering started becoming <laughs> Uh, fashionable and, and p on people's mind, you realize that um, the Afghans demonstrated several characteristics. Uh, it was, in my opinion, as a result of a mixture of angst and enthusiasm. But it also is a demonstration of Afghan ownership. Afghans, I think that after a very long time, realized that they are really the owners of the state and the owners of a nation, and they are part of a nation, and they're the owners of this constitutional order that has been put together since 2001. They have been galvanized and roused up over the last few months by the media, by rallies, by the candidates, by the tickets, and uh, you know all of these, civil society played a role. Everyone seems to have played a role including the government, including Mr. Karzai, in trying to, even though there were worries that at the last minute he might back off or, or scheme something, but, but that didn't happen. And in my opinion, what happened on Saturday was a mix of a vote that was a protest vote <clears throat> against anything and everything that, they, that Afghans see as negative, an obstacle, spoil, a spoilers, sort of uh, attitude on the part of those who want to destroy what they want to build, but also a vote for survival and a vote for the future and a vote for continuity of what is good. So it's a vote against what's bad and a vote for what's good. So I, I just wanted to add, you know, there are many other factors, of course, but I just wanted to add this to what I said earlier. Anyone else want to comment on this, Andrew? I think just briefly, just to highlight, I think how critically important it was, and I think that, that the high, extremely high turnout we saw um, is reflective of the fact that the Afghans, more than anyone, understood its importance on election day. Um, and, you know, I think just going out and, and you know, driving through Kabul, we, we headed out of town on election day um, about an hour north, but I've never seen lines like that. Um, anywhere on election day. Um, and, you know, I saw someone tweet, you know, today the Afghans can teach the British how to queue, you know, so <laughs> not only were they long, they were extremely orderly. Um, it was, so it was very, very impressive in that regard. Um, but I think again, you know, the, some of the points we touched on again, just the importance from a security angle in terms of BSA, I think from the political, from the economic angle, the continuation of, of engagement. But I think the continuation of the constitution Constitutional order is critically important in a recognition that there's not, uh, you know, a better alternative than this in terms of uh, future political stability. So I see it, um, certainly at the U.S. Institute of Peace, we were arguing that this is the key to their future peace and stability and that the vote was not just, you know, a democratic exercise, it was really a vote for, for future peace and stability there. Um, and I think the only other thing I would say in terms of its significance is, you know, I think a really real rejection of the Taliban, because um, the Taliban had made, um, you know, such a point of saying they wanted to disrupt the polls and that they're going to, you know, and they and they did. And they're in the lead up to elections. We had lots of security incidents um, uh, throughout the country. Election day, I mean, some people are interpreting it as um, a peaceful election. It was actually quite a violent election. And I think it's important to remember that. Um, uh, 2014 was actually more violent, uh, initial support reports indicate, than 2009. Um, the UN figures had like 300 security incidents on 2009. 
and pointing to about 400 security incidents in 2014. Um, but nevertheless, despite that and the threats and the intimidation, we had staff who in their home communities got night letters saying don't go out to vote. We did have this incredibly impressive turnout. So it's hard for me to interpret that as anything but a pretty significant defeat for the Taliban. So this was voting with your feet, really. Yeah. Uh, um, I, <clears throat> Amanullah, uh, as you see the election right now, we, we won't actually get any results or preliminary results until, I understand, the 24th of this month. Um, what, nevertheless, given what reports we do have. Do you have any sense here about uh, how it's going to turn out? Uh, again, we, uh, uh, we're, we're, we're hesitant to do that, but what, what are the early, what, the early reading here? How do you see it? Uh, well, it looks like, uh, as predicted by many analysts, that uh, Abdullah Abdullah may be uh, in the lead in the first round, for sure, it looks like. So Ashraf uh, Ghani Ahmad Zai would be the second one. And I think uh, now, they may be thinking of some alliances uh, to see that, um, that I mean, whoever has more support definitely is going to win the election. But probably there are some sensitivities um, involved here. One of the sensitivities is that uh, if um, uh, Zalmay Rasul, for example, his camp, uh, probably they would prefer to, to support uh, Ashraf Ghani. Uh, so it would be difficult for them because if they do that, it would look, it would look like that uh, one Pashtun is supporting another Pashtun, uh, which uh, probably can, uh, can, uh, can, like, can bring some uh, ethnic division in Afghanistan, if not tensions. So again, uh, when we talk of uh, Ahmad Ziya Massoud and um, Ismail Khan, both of them Tajiks, for example, they would be in a similar situation. Uh, probably one of the better options uh, for the two main candidates when they go to the second round would be uh, to not to have any alliances, and people anyway would vote on ethnic basis, but it wouldn't like so negative if people uh, decide uh, they, they form alliances on ethnic basis, which would not be good for the unity of Afghanistan, I think. All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, Ali, you want to add to that? <clears throat> yeah, I think we have to move a little bit more from uh, speculation and cliche things. I don't think it is ethnic. Uh, people uh, voted ethnically because all the tickets were multi-ethnic tickets. Secondly, I don't think that uh, the... Um, uh, alliance of the candidates is going to happen because both of them, Abdullah and uh, Shaf Ghani, made it clear that they are not interested in, in uh, a, a kind of a deal with the, with the, with the uh, front runners to form a government. But all candidates, all front runners, believe that the only, I think, uh, way that Afghanistan can stabilize itself is the creation of uh, unity government, regardless who wins the election. My talk with Abdullah, my talk with Ashraf Ghani and uh, Mirasul, all actually made a commitment and a pledge to do that. The, uh, I, I hear this that, okay, if there are two front runners, Abdullah and Ashraf Ghani, and uh, then we will know, uh, you know, probably in a few days, uh, the uh, third, uh, you know, the runner-up, the, 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 uh, will join one of these candidates. I don't, it does not happen in Afghanistan that way. When people support one candidate, it does not go as a package to another candidate. And then it splits, because some people go to one camp, some to other camp. So it is not, uh, ex you know, likely that if, Ashraf, I mean, uh, Zalmay Rasul decide if he is the third, uh, you know, uh, uh, he, he, he finishes third. If he decides to join one of the candidates, I don't think he will be able to take everybody with him to that camp. There will be a split. Because people join a, a person for different reasons. So we don't know. Maybe uh, the, uh, there's going to be very likely uh, a, a, run, a runoff election, maybe in, the, in the, the end of May or beginning of June, between two uh, front runners. Most likely, these two front runners will be Abdullah and Ashraf Ghani. In the others, it depends on these other how they make deals with other uh, groups, other candidates, other other constituencies to bring them to the, their sides, and uh, it will be very interesting to see. 
it is very difficult to speculate now. And uh, we will be in better position to know after to, to, uh, 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 I mean, uh, yeah. <coughs> April 24th. Well, IEC announced today that they are uh, going to announce, uh, they are going to put out uh, preliminary results uh, from about 20 to 25 percent of the vote, voters tomorrow. 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 Okay. Good. Uh, they have received so partial, far partial. Partial. Yes. Partial. Yes. Uh, they have received 85 percent of the ballots in Kabul so far. Having said that, I think that there is a common view, as the minister said, that. At the end of the day, we the country needs a government of national unity. Yeah. How do you form this? How do you come up with such a government is another issue. And I think it's too early to tell. But looking at the players at this stage, I think that the priority issue right now in the minds of at least the candidates and everybody else involved in the stakeholders is that we need to get the first round right. We are not yet finished with the first round. Mm -hmm. And it's a bit too early to talk about the second round at this stage. We still have some very serious issues in making sure that the first round is completed, is somewhat credible and acceptable, and that it does not cause a, a, a crisis. Because if the institutions who are responsible for the tabulation and the, the counting and the handling and the, uh, especially the complaints process, if they do not perform according to the expectations of most Afghans and the international community and according to the laws of the country, I think that that may cause a, a, a hiccup, a so, big hiccup. Uh, we shouldn't take for granted that this is going to be viewed as a credible election, then, is which, uh, because yet. I think a great, great many people came to that conclusion, haven't they? That uh, that the what they've seen here uh, suggests credibility. In fact, the candidates have kind of given slack here, saying, well, it wasn't perfect, but we'll, at the same time, uh, we saw it perhaps good enough. Hey, Andrew, did you want to? Yeah, I think they're, again, making predictions in Afghanistan is a dangerous business, and I should uh, highlight that I've already lost some money on this election already, so <laughs> you take, take my opinion with a grain of salt. But um, um, I think one is, I think they're, the day one of the election, all of us are out in generally some of the safer parts of the country, and we see, you know, in urban areas, and, and I think there's no question, you know, the enthusiasm for the vote. I mean, I've never... It reminded me of 2004 when I was out observing the elections in northern Afghanistan, the levels of hope and excitement. Um, and so I think we can't ignore that. And Afghanistan doesn't get that many good news days. And I think we really need to give them that Saturday as a good news day. However, in a lot of these elections, then some of the bad news starts coming in in sub subsequent days. And I think we are getting some of that. I think the fact that ballots ran out early um, in a lot of areas, some of it can be attributed to, um, well, partly the problem I think was overstated, uh, but some of it can be attributed to the enthusiasm, where generally we had a lot more voters to coming out to vote than we anticipated. Partly it's difficult to, in a country where we don't really know what the population is, and there isn't really good census data, and, and the voter registry doesn't tie voters to where they're actually going to vote. It's actually hard to predict where to send the ballots, and so this process and technical explanations like that. But the fact that some of the polling stations ran out of ballots in the morning is is quite suspicious. Um, and so I think, and that's, I had a meeting with the IEC just before I climbed on the plane to come back here a couple of days ago, and they were very aware of this, and they are making, I think, a, a good faith effort to examine that, because it is very important to try to understand what happened there, this early voting phenomenon, uh, to inform, in particular, the second round. So I think that there there is going to be disputes, but I don't think it's at, everyone, no one thinks it's at the level of 2000. 2009, and the volume of, I mean, the high levels of turnout has a very legitimizing effect that even if there's a problem, even if we have, say, 7 million votes and a million of them are fraudulent, you still have 6 million, which puts us 2.5 million more than in 2009. So I think there were problems. We're going to hear about more about that. But I think not to the extent that it's going to delegitimize the outcome of the first round. And so far, except with the one caveat, if 
you know, I feel like I said this in the media, that the voters did their part, now it's up to the candidates, and I think President Karzai to continue to do their part. And so far, they've made, I think, responsible statements. You know, there's problems, and there were. Those should be investigated, and they should, but not roundly trying to delegitimize the, the results of the first round. However, if, if in the counting process, and we have a result that one candidate is at 48, 49%, and as some votes get thrown out, creeps up over 50% and we have a first round winner. Or if we have someone who has 51, 52% and as votes get thrown out, they go down under 49, under 50%, then controversies could brew. And I think that's when I think we really need the, the top candidates to continue to behave in a responsive <clears throat> manner, not to delegitimize the result of the first round. Oh, that brings, of course, to mind the fact that there are two commissions here. There's the election commission, which my impression is that it has performed uh, up to the election and maybe through the election here in a, in a surprisingly independent way. Uh, what is your feeling here about the Complaints Commission? Because, Andrew, as you describe here, where if we get a more narrow, uh, then it's a question of whose ballots do they throw out? And uh, that, uh, would, would, that would, may very well be uh, where it comes down to. And here we have all members of that commission uh, who have been appointed by Hamid Karzai. Uh, do we have reason to be concerned about uh, perhaps that becoming a very controversial matter involving the Complaints Commission? Anyone? I think... Uh you know, nobody expected this uh, election to be flawless or, uh, without fraud. And uh, I think the uh, the uh, FIFA said uh, the other day said that there was eleven thousand violations. These are the uh, these are the the monitors from from Afghanistan themselves. Yeah. And uh, the election uh, complaint commission believes that there are hundreds of complaints so far. Well, some of them are very minor, probably. You know, the, 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 there were fraud. Everybody knows this. But the important thing is how it is going to be addressed. Will the investigation convince people that, OK, the investigation was fine, and then the, uh, the uh, ruling about these uh, uh, violations were acceptable to people? That's important. Some of them are very, uh, uh, I'm afraid, very, very serious. For example, today, or yesterday, actually, the election commission said that in Badakhshan, 25% of the, of the, of the uh, ballots probably will be disqualified. If that happens in Badakhshan, then how it affects the, the, the uh, uh, front runners? At the same time, there were uh, stuffing reports in Paktia. There were, uh, I think, uh, people in Kandahar and others burning uh, the, the, the boxes and uh, throwing the boxes somewhere in, in, in the river. These are serious issues. And the Election uh, Complaint Commission has until May 8 to give it its final uh, ruling and decisions. Until then, many things can happen. But there's one thing that many people will agree with me, maybe uh, Omar will agree, and, and you, that this election commission and election complaint commission is more trusted than the one that was in charge in 2009. I, I tend to think that the, the jury is out on the commissions. Yes. I think it's a bit too early. They just started their work. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, there's a lot of focus on the Complaints Commission. Uh, there's a lot of questions about the Complaints Commission uh, and whether they are, uh, uh, they, they are experienced enough and they, they are knowledgeable enough uh, about the intricacies of the process itself on one hand and whether there's a bias or not within the Complaints Commission. So the jury is out. I think that within the next couple of weeks, as you said, we will be able to have a better view of, of the credibility and the trust factor. But the point is, if, if they do not perform uh, properly, then I think that, again, we will, we will be facing an issue because um, especially the, the person who comes third, uh, in addition to being close to the 50% line, it's also the person who comes third who may not be very happy and who may 
who may have, mm -hmm. you know, some some uh, evidence or whatever they have. The good thing about Afghanistan this time around is that the monitoring and the observation was much more comprehensive than ever before. The data that has been collected from almost all centers and stations is much richer and more valuable than anything we've had in the past. So I think that it's going to be very hard for anyone <coughs> to uh, indulge in any type of mid to large scale fraud, mm -hmm. because I think that we have, we've had tens of thousands of observers, mostly Afghan, who were there present with their cell phones, with their cameras, and who who record, recorded mm -hmm. whatever has happened. Now, obviously, I've always said there's going to be, this election also will show us that there, there is a certain level of very sophisticated fraud. And I think that one of the, one of the reasons why we had in some cases, not all cases, in some cases, we had a shortage of ballot forms, ballot, ballots that had to be, uh, you know, that used by the citizen to vote. This shortage was, in my opinion, in some areas, there's, it shows that it probably was politically motivated. <coughs> not all, but some. So I hope that the IEC and especially the ECC will do their job properly, that the monitors will provide them with as much information as they can, and at the end of the day, that there will be accountability on all sides, mm -hmm. including those who have broken the law. Yeah. In the last election, there were uh, two international members of the, uh, of the uh, <coughs> Complaints Commission. Uh, we don't have that this time. Andrew? Just, yeah, just a po the point of the observers and the Canada agents, I think, is important. I mean, I was struck in the polling centers and stations I visited just how many Canada agents uh -huh. there were. I mean, I was up in a fairly you know, rural, a mountainous area, and each one had 10, 12, 14 Canada agents, many of them for the provincial council elections, but mostly some for the major presidential candidates as well. But there were reports from places like Herat where it actually became a problem. There's like 300 Canada agents <laughs> you know, trying to sit in a yeah. polling station watching people vote. I mean, because there were so many provincial council candidates, I mean, in Kabul province alone, there's about 400, and the ballot is eight pages long with all these names and faces. and um, so it's quite a complex process, but I think there were a lot of agents. I think one question I would have, though, is how many were there at the opening? And that's an area where we're trying to get more information. Because um, uh, I think if you have a combination of a, a polling station running out of ballots early and no observers there at the opening, I think that's a potential red flag um, area that would need further investigation. But just to highlight that the task is not easy. I mean, one of the areas we have capacity building a lot of areas, and the IEC in my opinion, the Independent Election Commission has really done quite a remarkable job on the process and a lot of the technical issues, and it is much more difficult to rig an election <laughs> in this one than last time. Um, however, if you can fill a ballot box half full with legit illegitimate votes before anyone shows up and then fill the rest of it with legitimate votes, it's very difficult to separate the two. Whereas in 2009 elections, it was a lot less sophisticated. You had some times where the entire ballot booklet of ballots, they didn't even bother to tear the ballots off the booklet. They just filled them in, crammed them in, and there is evidence of some where there's footprints on the top where they're on top stepping on it to cram more ballots into these things. And so I think there, there it was pretty amateurish and easy to discard some of those kind of ballots, whereas this, this time around it's going to be more complicated. The last point I wanted to make is on the commissions, I, I certainly think the IEC in terms of the process to date has earned quite a bit of credibility. I think the test is now going to be a bit more in the Electoral Complaints Commission, where I think there were more concerns in terms of who some of the, you know, who appointed them, who heads it. Um, however, I think you, there, I, I, put this out as a theory that as the lame duck hood of President Karzai <laughs> seems to be more and more apparent, even those who are maybe appointed because they're perceived to be loyal um, are now maybe looking to their future. Um, and in terms of just a couple days before the election, the Complaints Commission uh, did an investigation on allegations that I think the Rasul campaign and another campaign were involved in using government resources um, 
uh, you know, for for the polls. And the ECC did an investigation. They fined two of the candidates, but more importantly, they made a recommendation to President Karzai that he dismiss the governor of, of uh, Paktia, Hamdard, who was very influential and was backing Rasul in that campaign, as well as the chief of police of Kandahar, Razik, who is, again, a very important player in local politics down there and was also perceived to be uh, supporting uh, Zalmay Rasul. So again, a fairly strong recommendation to dismiss two key actors who were uh, supporting what was presumed by many Afghans to be more the status quo candidate. Uh, and, and so I think that also gave a little boost of confidence in maybe some of what the ECC might be able to do. Well, that, that raises the question, how much influence did Hamid Karzai have on the election, try to have on the election? Do we have any good measures of this? <laughs> There's all my Rasul's performance is one. Yeah. Uh, oh, the very fact that, that are, are we, even if there wasn't, there was a strong perception yeah. of his support. Um, and I actually don't think he probably directly interfered to the extent that many people did. But I think when he he was involved in Kayum Karzai stepping down and joining the um, the Rasul camp very publicly then what perceives or currently seems to be a rather poor performance by Dr. Zalma Rasul in this election, I think would, would be interpreted by many Afghans as President Karzai's um, uh, influence being more limited than I think many people anticipated. I think Zalma Rasul was his favorite candidate from day one. But he did not invest all his political capital for him to win. He was watching him. And uh, at the same time, he did not forget uh, Ashraf Ghani. He continued to talk to him. And uh, so that I think he, to some extent, he encouraged many people in the government to support uh, Zalwe Rasul. But at the same time, he also reached out to uh, Ashraf Ghani. And also to Abdullah, he spoke with Abdullah several times. I think he was hedging a bit at some extent. For him, I think, Abdullah, Ashraf Ghani, Zalman Rasul, all of them are acceptable. But he, at the same time, did not want to become so involved in supporting one of the candidates that will actually give him a bad name. I think uh, at this point, when he, I've heard several times from, from his entourage for him that he is going to see what uh, is the decision of people of Afghanistan. He may have us in favorite, but at the same time, he is not going to interfere. But many government, uh, uh, you know, organizations, individuals uh, interfered in support of uh, the um, Zalmay Rasul. Although the cabinet is split, some people are supporting uh, the Ashraf Ghani, some uh, uh, Abdullah some uh, Zalmay Rasul. But what is important is not the cabinet, it's the people in the field. Police chiefs, the governors, the district administrators, the uh, intelligence officials, some of them, in fact, supported the government, uh, you know, uh, what they call a Sarkari uh, candidate. Uh, I don't know if I can say it. Please, please. Establishment, yes. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I think actually uh, probably uh, President Karzai uh, knew that uh, there would be a runoff election, and I think that's very important. At the same time, I think it's uh, uh, in the modern day Afghanistan, uh, it's very difficult for anybody uh, to interfere th with the election because there is uh, the country has uh, an unusually very powerful uh, and to some extent very uh, independent media and um, so I'm sure that even if uh, President Karzai is thinking to favor one particular candidate I think it would be very difficult for him even in the second round but that would be the real test of President Karzai because the second round would decide who is the ultimate president of the country so we will have to see but uh, the signs uh, from the uh, first round for example uh, are that uh, that we, we don't see so far like uh, any evidence that President Karzai has interfered with it. Well, let's talk about the second round for just a moment. Um, <clears throat> right now, the anticipation is if there is a second round, uh, that will occur late in May, uh, early in June, although late, that, early June, probably early June, probably. Um, if that's the case, what's the difference in the dynamic now? Uh, 
are many of the things that we're discussing here about uh, the credibility of the election, uh, is that going to become more acute in the second round? Uh, is, is it likely that we would see more or less fraud in the second round? What, what's, what's your take on this? May, yeah. Sorry, oh. may, may I uh, finish the Hamid Karzai yeah, uh, yeah. Foot, <laughs> footprint? <laughs> Um, and then get to the second round. Uh, I think that for Hamid Karzai, two issues are of priority importance. Uh, one of obviously is, is legacy and his place in history. Mm -hmm. uh, he's very concerned about that, and so he might not do anything that could uh, damage uh, that prospect. And the other is a mix of immunity and level of influence over the country's affairs in the future. And so he has to take these two, these three or two uh, issues into consideration. And I think that whatever role he plays from here on, and I don't, I don't totally agree with with Andrew. I don't think he's he's a lame duck yet. I think he's on his way to becoming a lame duck. And and he can he still has some cards to partially. partially lame duck yeah and he still has some cards to play and some maybe some important parts cards to play both with the. Uh, with the uh, ECC and IEC process and the vote counting, as well as in the second round, and as well as in putting together a, na a government of national unity. I think that his preferred, his preference would be to put together all of them, all three of them, maybe all, all five of them, or six of them. I think that he would like to see maybe uh, even uh, Sayoff uh, and uh, uh, one or two of the other candidates uh, play a certain role. Um, that has been sort of his style over the years. Uh, and for him to become uh, sort of the statesman uh, uh, in the future uh, uh, to whom everybody turns to for advice and, and, and consultation. So that's, that's, I think, what Ahmed Karzai wants to do. And so he, he has a very fine line to walk. Uh, because if, if he rocks the boat too hard and if, he, if he, his, his decisions are too abrupt, uh, or too one-sided, then obviously he's going to miss that opportunity uh, concerning his own future. Now, on the second round, um, assuming that there's going to be a second round, and I think most of us sort of agree on this panel that there, there might be a second round, uh, unless there's some kind of a surprise, um, it is going to be dynamic, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Uh, and I, I feel that the Afghan people would want to and my hope is that the Afghan people would want to take this and see this through all the way to the end. So that they continue to participate, they continue to be part of this, and they continue to show the same resolve as they did in the first round. Um, obviously, things are going to be different. This is not, you know, this is not a field of 11 people turned into eight people. This is one versus, you know, one on one. And, um, and I think the issues will be framed differently. I think that the, uh, the, the campaign will be managed and styled differently. Will it be more bitter? And, and it might turn out to be more bitter. And, and some of it is healthy, and some of it may not be healthy. But hopefully they will keep their cool, some more than others. And we, we, uh, we will have, hopefully, you know, a, a campaign that is uh, productive. Again, the role, again, this is where I think the Taliban, again, or will become a, a, a question mark. We, we cannot, we do not know exactly what will the Taliban do between round one and round two. Are they going to keep quiet and calm? Will they try to take side? Will they try to disrupt? Or kill one person so that the whole and, thing will... And, and then take or, or assassinate one person and the whole thing falls apart. So I mean, anything. Explain, explain what would happen if one of the candidates were yeah, to die. Constitution. Yeah. So uh, it's not it, something we should probably clarify too in too much yeah, detail. Yeah, yeah, for the yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we might give some people some but, ideas. <laughs> but there are risks. I mean, definitely there are risks in, involved, and and so we need to be cognizant of that. Um, and I'll pass it on to the others because I think one of the major concerns is that if before the announcement of final results of the election, one of the candidates. Not one of the candidates, one of the eight, is assassinated. And then the whole election falls apart. They have to do it all over again. 
Yes. If Taliban wants to, uh, the, to spoil this election, to destroy this election, they have to <laughs> They've got eight target. possible targets. They have to target one of the uh, yeah. I think that will be a master strike. Yeah. This is the problem. That's why I was trying to tell everybody that you have to go underground after yeah. the... Uh, you know, the, uh, one of my questions is, what do we have to fear most in the next few weeks? And I think we've just, we've just named it, haven't we? Uh, that all of this could be entirely disrupted, and then it would be uh, perhaps... Uh, to, to another year to an, uh, prepare for elections. Uh, we could we could see this in, entire process uh, undermined by by such an action. You could see people other than the Taliban benefiting from that scenario. So, yeah, yeah, yeah this is. Uh, <laughs> any any other thoughts about the second round? Uh, I think the rank and files will fight. It will be very better if not at the top among the rank and files. That's something that I'm afraid of. Yeah. I think the only thing I would add was I think there was quite a bit of talk about mm. consensus making and deal making prior to the election. That didn't really happen. There's been some talk about maybe there a deal after the first round. Um, I think if the first round had been a disaster, you might have need some kind of backroom politicking to try to reach some kind of consensus to salvage a, a, a bad process. The fact that the first round went much better than expected, I think, really needs to rule out the idea of some backroom deal now. And I think it, it has, and the major candidates have now discounted that. But I think there were some people still speculating and maybe even wishing we could actually get a deal so we don't need a second round, maybe sign the BSA earlier, and that scenario was being discussed. But I think now there's absolutely, I mean, if there isn't a first round winner, it's really essential to have the second round, I think, for this ultimate result to be viewed as legitimate. But there are good, will be if there is a second round, there will be, have been six losers. Will they? Will any of these, or all of them, not try to deliver some vote bank to one of the candidates? And is that process going to be going forward? Not as a package, but maybe uh, part of each, the, part of the constituents, each uh, candidate probably will make their own choice. Unless you have, uh, you know, you look at the some of the major uh, blocks like Ismail Khan's Tajiks in Herat. Probably he will make a decision and his Tajiks will go with him. But with uh, one of the other uh, results of this election, he said there was a rejection of Taliban. Yet also it was rejection of Hizb Islami too, of Hikmatyar, because he had one horse in the race. Mm -hmm. And that he did miserably bad. So maybe the, there are four Hizb Islami, they will make different decisions. And uh, with the uh, Zamay Rasul, if he does not make it to the second round, his constituency also will be split. Some will join one of uh, one of the uh, you know front runners, uh, and the, the, other, the rest the other one. So it it is it is something which is uh, in Afghanistan is an atomized society. Afghanistan. It is so one of the nerdy details I'm kind of interested in is mm -hmm. why some of the other candidates actually didn't step down. Because I mean I did my dissertation on Pakistani politics, and much I first met Marvin has reviewed my dissertation. Thank you very much. <laughs> We're really uh, a, pain, a painful <laughs> process, but there is a phenomenon there. You saw, you know, you're standing up in order to sit down. So you basically put your name up as a candidate to split a clan vote or whatever, and then you get a payoff of some sort to step down. But the payoff is to step down before the election, uh, else after the election when you've gotten very few votes, you don't have any leverage. And so why some of the candidates like Sultan Zoy or Arsula, who are never going to do terribly well, but in particular, I think Hizbi Islami, who had the most to lose, um, you know, where their candidate was there, uh, somewhat in, endorsed by Hikmatyar, um, and then to do miserably in the election, I think just highlights their weakness. And I'm, so I'm a bit intrigued by why the week before the election, some of these people didn't try to you know, negotiate and step down and get something in, for, in, in exchange for doing that, rather than to have their weak, weakness highlighted in, in the election. But I just wanted to come back to the point also that Ali made earlier, which I think is very true, is that I think, um, I mean, there's reports now, you know, that, you know, 
Uh, Rasul has gone to meet with Abdullah and there's you know, some negotiation taking place. But exactly how many votes Rasul actually brings, I mean, I think is quite quite questionable. It's not, and I would say very few. I think it's actually the people who are aligned with him. I mean, who is Kayum Karzai and Mahmoud Karzai not going to, who is, you know, the chief of police in Kandahar going to back, who are Matullah and Rizgan. Some of these people are much more important in terms of bringing certain votes. And, and I think I actually agree. I don't think any of these candidates can deliver large amounts of vote banks in, in that form it's going to be fragmented I think I think that it's going to be uh, uh, going towards the second round it's going we were going to see a whole new set of realignments uh, some will stay the way they are obviously and others will shift and hedge um, but to answer Andrew's question about the other five let's say or three or four who should have stepped down I think Ekmatyar's candidate is a, is, is a case aside. I think Igmatior uh, and his candidate knew very well that yeah. they were not going to do well, and, and they, they, but they wanted to show that commitment to continue till the end and, and not bow out. I mean, the fact that he, had one, he has one foot in the political arena and another foot in the militant arena <laughs> shows that you know, he, he's playing all sides and, and he just wants to be, be relevant. And, and um, uh, the good thing is that the, the Afghan people obviously uh, gave him a resounding <coughs> answer. But as far as the others are concerned, I'm, you know, I'm, uh, it's anyone's guess as to <laughs> maybe, maybe Minister Jalali, who was almost a candidate, can tell us. But um, some are, I think, looking at the second round mm -hmm. as a, uh, and, then, and then coming out and saying, well, I'm, I'm in favor of swords and endorsing someone. Yeah. Uh, they saw this probably going into a second round, so they didn't feel any reason why they should bow out early. And they will bow out later on, even though they're no longer in the running. Mubana? Mubana? Yeah. Uh, I think Abdullah Abdullah, in a recent interview to the BBC, uh, made it very clear that he's not interested to have any alliance with anybody else. Probably it can give uh, some like a hint that, let's say, if... Um, uh, I don't know what its uh, relationship is with Ahmed Zia Masood and Ismail Khan. Probably they, they, they were uh, allied actually in the past and probably they still have some understanding. If these two gentlemen, if they keep quiet, uh, so it is understandable. Uh, we're going to, the, the, their supporters will vote for Abdullah Abdullah. If not all of them, the majority of them. So it's quite suitable uh, for, um, for, the, uh, for, uh, for Abdullah. In this case, if like uh, Ahmed Zia Masood and uh, Ismail Khan, they keep quiet because the supporters would anyway vote for Abdullah Abdullah. So we have to see that what's going to happen if, for example, Zermay Rasul, there are chances like earlier, it was said that if he supports Abdullah Abdullah, again, it depends how much, how many votes he gets, because he would like to matter, and he's very closely linked to Karzai, for example, again, and President Karzai wants to be in Afghanistan, um, and he, his house uh, was already almost close to completion, is next to the presidential palace, so we have to think, we, ha we, we will be thinking about all these factors. Um, we... We ought to ask ourselves, shouldn't we, what this election means here for reconciliation, for reintegration. Uh, how do you see this now, especially with regard to reintegration? Uh, uh, the, has, assuming now that the process goes forward and that we have a, re a legitimate government uh, by the end of the summer, uh, is this going to make a great deal of difference here in the way in which um, the, the, the potential here for, at least for a, a deal or for accelerating this reintegration process, which means incrementally the, the uh, insurgency giving way? Ali? If this uh, election, at the end of the day, unified the country and bring a government that is seen as legitimate, I think this is going to uh, uh, encourage some, if not all, of the armed opposition to think twice. Because the longer the state survives in Afghanistan, the less chance they will have to prevail. I told them their representative in a track two in December of last year in France that 
Afghanistan missed two opportunities and its partners to make peace with the Taliban when the situation was favorable. Uh, one was in 2001, the other one in 2003. But now everybody is trying to support this government. They look this government, this system, the state system as a legitimate. So I think you now think about it. You may miss the opportunity. Because the longer the state survives, the, 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 the longer the people unify and believe in, in, the, in the, 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 the longer the new generation comes up in Afghanistan. <coughs> I think the longer Afghanistan develops uh, economically, I think you will have less and less chance to get a better deal at peace. So you have to think about it. I think this election, if it actually goes smoothly, the, the, the results is seen as legitimate and credible by the Afghan people, this can probably force that the, the opposition, if not all of them, probably those who have, you know, other than ideological motivation to, to fight, to Think, uh, think twice and probably support the reconciliation. But it will take time. The same thing, at the same time, this can also probably send a message to these foreign supporters. Mm -hmm. They can also, if they realize that the country is going to make it, there's a, some level of stability coming, uh, going to happen in Afghanistan, they will also think twice. And we're talking about Pakistan? Yes, about Pakistan, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I, I agree. I think, I think that uh, the, the message, one of the messages coming out of this election, uh, if everything goes sm fairly smoothly by the time we have a new government in place, is going to be very clear and loud to the Taliban and their backers in Pakistan uh, and beyond Pakistan as well. Uh, that uh, this country has decided its path, has chosen its path, mm -hmm. and that there is no turning back. Mm -hmm. And either they will have to, and this will have an impact on the rank and file of the Taliban, definitely. To what extent, we don't know. We may end up having a core hardliner group remain for a long time, mm -hmm. um, like many others in that region have been able to survive. Uh, but as long as as long as the the larger uh, contingency of the Taliban uh, and those who are willing to come back into Afghanistan and have a normal, peaceful and honorable life uh, are willing to do so, there's nothing that can stop that. And, and I think that we are heading in that direction as long as we have a government that is unified, as long as there's a government that uh, has a strategy and as, as, as speaking from a position of strength. The problem over the past few years with this reconciliation process has been that it didn't speak from a position of strength, and that's why we don't have any results. Yeah. And well, just, just very briefly on that, I mean, I think there's you know, many drivers of the conflict there, but I think one you know, certainly was the whole issue of uh, bad governance, corruption, predatory elites at the local level. And I think um, there is an opportunity there, whether it will be seized is another matter, but with a new regime, a government coming to power, um, recognizing that the dynamic has changed, the blank check economy of the past decade is no longer going to be in place. You can't just get away with, you can't have another Kabul bank scandal and have the international community remain engaged. That a reform agenda, to some extent, has to move forward in certain areas, and that doesn't mean overnight we're going to see everything change, but it, it does mean that if some things don't change, many in the international community are going to walk away. And I think any of the new leading candidates who I think will be, have the potential to become president are smart enough to recognize that, that there's going to be have to be some improvements on the government, governance front. And I think that, as one of the significant drivers of the insurgency, I think could have an impact combined with what I do think, and call me naive, uh, a, a, a slight shift in the perceptions of Pakistan in particular in terms of what its interests are in Afghanistan. So I think those uh, things do no. give at least some hope. Another change is there won't be the US and NATO to kick around. Um, with the withdrawal um, that uh, the argument that this is all about ousting the occupiers is, is certainly is not going to carry the weight that it had earlier. Um, which leads me to ask, uh, so with the election now, um, 
uh, as we look at our role in Afghanistan, uh, should we, should we uh, see this now as uh, uh, already as indicating uh, that we will probably be there for, for another five, ten years? Uh, what, what's the implications here for the, for the relationship with Afghanistan going forward? Could I just say I feel very strongly on that issue that we not conclude that, oh, this is a successful election. This pr proves that the Afghans can do things on their own. There's no more need for foreign <laughs> assistance and engagement. We can actually go to the zero option quickly. So that's my personal view. That would be not be the correct uh, interpretation of the, the result from this election. Because I think it does show that in a partnership, you know, lots can be achieved. And I think we're getting to the point where a whole new relationship could emerge. Um, a much, you know, um, and I think it it would be really quite tragic if in that time of tremendous opportunity for a new relationship, I think moving forward on a more sustainable level of engagement, um, you know, that we not give up at this stage in terms of Afghanistan. Because I think most of us who work on Afghanistan, I think, do feel quite strongly that that would be a, a disaster, not only for Afghanistan, not only for the region, but also for the U.S. Uh, interests in the region. Omar? Uh, I think that... Oh, sorry. Oh, go, go ahead, and then, and then. Sorry, I think that um, the Afghan people uh, attempted to also say that they value the engagement of the, of the international community, that they need some level of support in the years to come, uh, and that one of the motivators for going out and voting was that they realized that we are arriving at a, to, you know, at a milestone, and we are reaching a milestone, and there is a possibility of a zero option. There is a possibility of uh, foreign aid drying up totally. There is a possibility of the government and the country going bankrupt. This is very much on people's mind in Afghanistan. Businesses are suffering, have suffered over the last few months. Um, you know, employment is a problem, is a big issue. Uh, uh, unemployment, uh, and you have this youth bulge that's uh, that's undecided as to what to do. Should they leave the country? Should they stay? And and it would be a disaster if they chose to to leave. And so I think that one of the reasons they they voted was to say, you see, we we can be a good partner, but there's more work to be done. And I hope that that message uh, is is understood in Washington and in other capitals as well. One footnote to this, that uh, after this election, after the, the, this week, I was talking to people in Kabul that the uh, exchange rate of Afghani is doing better now. And the uh, car dealers are telling that they have sold more cars in one week than they did in three <laughs> months before. The real estate is doing better. So it, it is a hope that this election gives to people. Not only that the, the country will make it, it will be another, a new government, at the same time they believe that BSA will be signed, bilateral security agreement will be signed. Yes. Yeah. Uh, just one thing, uh, uh, we all, all talked about the BSA, it's so crucial for, Af uh, for Afghans, there's no doubt. But I think the U.S. relation with the next Afghan leader, I think uh, there are bound to be some, uh, some differences uh, arising in the future, and it looks like it can happen. Because for any Afghan leader, it's very important for him to look like a strong man. And, and the Afghan constituency sometimes uh, is different from the American constituency. So for example, give an example. Like um, Ashraf Ghani, he was in Kandahar and he was giving his, his uh, electoral speech in Kandahar. And he said that he's going to release more prisoners uh, from Bagram if he comes to power. So while this actually puts no. him... Uh, no, no, correction. He said that those who are incarcerated for no justifiable reasons, they will be released through the legal process. But those who are, are in prison because they damage the country, we will uh, you know, uh, never forgive them, never release them. Okay, probably, but uh, anyway, uh, the, the differences with the, what I'm saying, the point I'm trying to make is that mm -hmm. it's... Uh, 
It's a lot better if the two sides, the uh, Afghan president and the U.S., they avoid giving public statements if they have if they have differences. It's better they choose uh, diplomatic channels um, as much as possible. Or if there is a hearing, a congressional hearing, then again it will come to the media. Nobody can stop it. But I think it would be good for the relations of the two countries that they avoid um, giving public statements for political reasons. Okay. Well, this uh, BEC was approved by the people of Afghanistan, by Jarga. It is, it is, it is quite, and people want the, the, their candidates to make a commitment that they will sign it. Right. <laughs> um, okay, well, I think we, uh, we can, at this point, entertain some questions from the floor. And I see a question right down here. P please rise and identify yourself and keep, keep the comment, uh, please, uh, or, or, or question brief. Thank you. Uh, this is an excellent panel. My name is Amin Nojan, student at SAIS. Uh, my question is, uh, between the first round and the second round, um, yesterday the ceasefire expired between the TTP and the Pakistani government. So um, what impact uh, could that have on Afghanistan's elections and security situation? Um, in the meantime, until the second round, if a uh, new agreement of peace is reached, between the government and the TTP, will it have a positive or negative effect on the Afghanistan elections, or will it have no effect at all? Um, yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, who would like? Just a, a point. I think that the, the perception of Afghanistan was this, that with this uh, ceasefire, Pakistani and Afghan Taliban were trying to, to undermine Afghanistan elections. And uh, I think probably that was the re the, one of the, of the uh, fears in Afghanistan that can happen. It did not happen. There was one incident on the 8th of March that Pakistani Taliban and Afghanistan clashed in Lora near Miramsha on the border because the Pakistani Taliban were pushing Afghan Taliban to undermine and destroy the election, and they refused. Five people of each side were killed there. So it is not working the way that it was, it was uh, expected. Can I just say on that, I was in Pakistan the week before and then moved up to, and was talking. I think that a lot of the analysis of Afghans, that the whole TTP ceasefire thing had everything to do with Afghanistan and nothing to do with Pakistan politics was actually misplaced. There is a tendency to want to, and I think, you know, historically there's quite understandable reasons for why it's done in Afghanistan to blame a lot of problems on Afghanistan. But the issue of the ceasefire of the TTP, I personally think, had very, very little to do with Afghan elections and, and the situation in Afghanistan and a lot more to do with Pakistani pol politics and civil mill relations and Nawaz Sharif's constituency in the Punjab and a lot of those kind of, you know, Pakistani-specific issues. So I would just say discount right. the relationship I, with the Afghan election. I, and myself, having just come back from Pakistan, uh, I share this. Uh, one interesting part of it, which I did hear, uh, and which is, I think, uh, ought to be worrisome, uh, ex if there were to be an agreement reached with the TTP, and it would likely be a containment agreement, not one that resolves the differences in Pakistan. But of course, any kind of agreement which leads to less activity against the state of Pakistan by the Pakistani Taliban frees up people to interfere in Afghanistan. So uh, you have to see that the possibility of, of, of a gain in Pakistan, if that's what it is, is not necessarily good news for Afghanistan. Uh, yeah, it looks like it, it's a very crucial question, actually, uh, and it's very much uh, will uh, uh, can change the course of the future of the region. If the uh, uh, if an agreement happens with the Taliban and it stays, so Pakistan would be in a situation. Even if right now um, the tech Taliban is extremely unpopular uh, in Pakistan, that is something probably many people don't know. <coughs> the the vast majority of the uh, Pakistani intellectuals, the vast majority of the journalists, of the politicians as well, all of them are uh, against the Taliban right now. So actually, when when we look at the Pakistani intellectual journalists and uh, politicians, they speak the same language about the Taliban, like the ones they speak in Kabul. This is a big change. So there are many people in Pakistan as well. Actually, they're very much against talking to the Taliban. They want military actions. So 
if you look at the past history of uh, signing agreements uh, with the Taliban or speaking uh, peace with the Taliban, it looks like the chances of any agreement to be successful are very slim. And finally, there would be a military action. So what I think right now, uh, this election in Afghanistan uh, has showed something that Taliban uh, do not have significant support in Afghanistan. And they, to some extent, are very much irrelevant. So it's a good, it's a good choice for Pakistan now not to support them at all, because people in Pakistan are against them as well. So if the talks fail, it will make for the Pakistani military and the establishment a lot easier to take big action against the Taliban, because they wouldn't care about the Taliban in Afghanistan. So this, is, uh, this has to be seen, what's going to happen. Thank you. A question, yes. <clears throat> My name, is Mike My name is Michael Alban. I'm an independent researcher. No one has mentioned the uh, provincial elections so far. Is this because they are unimportant or perhaps uh, too far from the center ring for our attention? Thank you. Andrew, you're resident on this. No, I think very good question, and it's always the omission we make. At USIP, we just published a, a paper just before the election on provincial council, but it didn't get as much uh, interest as some of our ones on presidential elections. But provincial council, I think, are extremely important. And as I sort of just the anecdote I had, there's a lot more, you know, at the, at the local level, a lot, that's where a lot, a lot of the contest is over, the provincial council seats. In fact, on, on where the areas where we went were actually technically people weren't meant to be campaigning on election day. The provincial council candidates are often, and, and with their candidate agents, were much more involved in the process because the stakes are, are actually quite high uh, in some of the local politics there. And, it, and I'm not always exactly, it's a bit of a mystery sometimes why, because the role of the provincial councils is very ambiguous and, and you know, they don't really have much of a formal role to play. Um, in earlier elections, they had an important role to play as a whitener, whitening effect for candidates with bad reputations or with militias or war crimes or corruption or whatever. But you have the protection, you know, once you're a PC candidate, it gave you some form of protection and legitimacy. Um, uh, but some people, and I think it's hard to determine uh, that we have, uh, there's someone actually there doing research on this now, to what extent was some of the turnout, um, high levels of turnout uh, facilitated by the fact that the provincial council and presidential council elections were linked uh, this time around. Um, because earlier, there, a year ago when this was being, being debated, there were some people advocating we shouldn't keep them together. But I think I think it's an interesting research question we don't have an answer for, but actually the combining them maybe actually was one of the factors that contributed to uh, the high levels of participation in the election. But that's just a theory. The uh, campaign that uh, the uh, for uh, provincial uh, council election was uh, more impressive this year than in the past. But most of the people who campaigned here were those who uh, eyed to come to the Senate. Because from uh, each province, the, uh, the two members of the provincial council can come to make the two thirds of the Senate with the one third uh, you know, uh, appointed by the president. So, uh, the rest of the uh, people who stays in the, in the provincial council do not have a very, very active role. And on the other hand, as Andrew said, this year the uh, uh, provincial council election was overshadowed by the presidential election. But at the same time, those who were very vocal in the campaign were those who actually eyed to become members of the Senate, to come to the Senate. And that make it, uh, you know, uh, important for those people. But for the rest, I think they want some kind of local influence, legitimize uh, to, to, to themselves, um, or, or give, give a kind of a uh, uh, veneer of legitimacy to strong people in the provinces. Two quick points on, on provincial councils. Uh, I think that on one hand, this is seen by some of the candidates as a springboard for future role in politics, including this a Senate seat. But at the same time, what was very impressive about the provincial councils is the increased uh, participation of women, yeah, yes. women candidates, yeah. 
uh, across the board. Mm -hmm. uh, the number of women who came out, especially in, in very uh, dangerous regions from da dangerous provinces. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, from Wardak to Logar to Kandahar. And so this has been very impressive overall. Yes, I, I, interesting that you mentioned that because I sat in on provincial councils and was really impressed with the women on these councils. They were among the most active and uh, uh, even though, as pointed out, it doesn't have a great deal of formal power, uh, people were taking their roles quite seriously, as I, as I could see it. Uh, yes, Richard. Thank you all for your commentary. Uh, Rich Kramer from the National Endowment for Democracy. Um, I'm going to ask you all to dare to dream with my question. So we're actually looking at a potential Abdullah or a potential Ghani presidency. W gentlemen, would you be willing to sort of maybe give us what you think would be the distinguishing characteristics between the two? Should either of them uh, succeed to the executive office? Thank you. So m many of you know the candidates well. No, no, I, 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 I don't think either do, of them. I, You've already selected. <laughs> <laughs> You've already made a choice. <laughs> what choice? <laughs> okay, let, let's see. Let's look at the. I, I don't think that uh, on major issues these people uh, look differently. Maybe in uh, the uh, the teams that they build, the team they make probably will different. One issue is that uh, Ashraf. Uh, believes that uh, for the time being, I think it is the uh, presidential system should continue, but at the same time, a commission should be set up to review the constitution and see when it is possible for the country to change the system from presidential to parliamentary system. But uh, Dr. Abdullah believes that parliamentary system uh, suits the country much better. However, he does, he is not going to rush to this issue. Again, he also believed, as he's told me, that uh, he will also review the constitution and see how to, uh, when can Afghanistan go, you know, transit from a presidential system to a parliamentary system. But eventually, uh, he believes that Afghanistan will be better served with a, uh, through a parliamentary system. Other than that, I believe, I, I don't think that uh, in major issues, international issues, relation with the neighbors, relation with the region, relation with the uh, international partners, there will be difference of views between these two teams. I'm not much of a dreamer, but I can tell you that uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I stayed away from partisan politics uh, because uh, I think that uh, I have, I have uh, views on all of these contenders, but obviously uh, the two that are emerging as the leading contestants uh, s seem to have uh, qualities that ser will serve the country well, in my opinion. I do agree that they, they share uh, a lot in terms of vision, in terms of uh, belief in the democratic process, in terms of uh, participation, inclus inclusivity, uh, in terms of um, reform, they're, they're both reform-minded. Their constituencies may not be the same, uh, and that's natural. I mean, you, you build your constituencies uh, as politics dictates. Uh, but there's a lot that they have in common. And I have, we have all seen them work together in the past, uh, actually work very effectively. Uh, we have seen them uh, in action together uh, for the same government. Uh, and I believe that I would rather see, you know, that kind of collaborative yes. uh, sort of uh, uh, future mm -hmm. in, in, in an Afghan government than to see uh, too much, you know, hustle and tussle and too much conflict or tension. <clears throat> and that's our hope. Uh, but uh, whenever I decide personally to endorse someone, uh, I'll let everyone know, but <laughs> I, I haven't yet. And I, I was waiting for the second round. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not endorsing anyone either. Um, the one thing I would add, and this came a little bit earlier, but in either of them, either of those two candidates, if they were to become president, the idea that, as I think was suggested in the New York Times article a week ago, that they're going to give President Karzai a really prominent role, um, I find hard to imagine. 
I think both of them would treat President Karzai with respect. Um, I think they wouldn't necessarily go after him and his family. Um, I think you know there would be the, the, the appropriate levels of respect given. But I mean, those of you who know Dr. Ghani or Dr. Abdullah, the idea that they're going to put you know President Karzai next to them and just do what what these people yeah. tell, I think is very. And I think that so I, I personally see that as very hard to believe. When, but that's being speculated on what will President Karzai's post-election role be. And my own guess is that will become increasingly minimal. Uh, just if I can add one, one point to your, to your question. I think when, uh, the policies would be very similar, generally. It looks like uh, that Ashraf Ghani is an economist. He's and not, he's an anthropologist. 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 Uh, well, but, yeah, but, but, but he is. Yeah, to, he's, to he's, some extent, like, he's, he's very well, interested in the economy. He's very much interested in the economy. And when he talks about Afghanistan, he, he talked about uh, economy more than other things. And uh, probably this would be one of the areas that would be different. Probably Ashraf Ghani may have more uh, plans about the economy of the country uh, compared to Abdullah's plans. L let, me do, let me amplify this. Mm -hmm. I remember, this is exactly 25 years ago, Ashraf Ghani and I are sitting in Peshawar at the Afghan Information Center, which was a government, U.S. government-funded uh, outfit. And Ashraf Ghani regaled me with all of his plans for the future of Afghanistan. He had it all laid out in his mind what he would do if he could remake Afghanistan. And I, I, it was an entire afternoon, and he spelled it all out. Uh, I, I found it remarkable then, and uh, uh, it's, it's probably indicative of something. Now, you know how I would put it? it they, would, they would make a wonderful combination. One guy is the outside, and the other is the inside. Uh, uh, Abdullah is a perfect international diplomat in representing Afghanistan. He's already been foreign minister. Uh, I don't know whether he would want to accept that position again, but uh, he can present certainly a progressive face for Afghanistan, for the international community. And uh, whereas uh, <clears throat> Ashraf Ghani is a micromanager and will be you know, focused laser-like on, on, on the details. Uh, one has people skills, the other has far less. So this is an interesting combination. Let, let's uh, look at this. I was part of a team, all of us, me, Ashraf Ghani, Zalami Khalidzad, uh, Atmar, uh, Ahadi, all these technocrats, and uh, Qayyum Karzai was with us for a while too. And we worked on the program for one year. And that program is an elaborate program on all the aspects. Then we represent, we were represent, uh, I represented that group in the all party, uh, you know, council with Dr. Abdullah and others. And we saw no difference in our program in Dr. Abdullah's program. Okay. So, so in both sides, bo both, both candidates believe that they should change the president to presidency. So the decision-making uh, mechanism will be different in the future. In, instead of one person making the decision that was the case in the past, I think a, 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 a wider mechanism should be established in the presidency. So the, so the decision on all important issues should be taken together. We have time for one more question. Let's over here, or perhaps two, we'll see. My name is Brad Hansen. I'm a retired U.S. diplomat who served in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan's been mentioned by the panel, but Iran has not. I wonder if, in your view, Iran played much of a role at all in the election and how its role was perceived by the Afghan political elite and the Afghan man and woman in the street. Hmm. Well... <laughs> Well, I don't know. There are speculation that a lot of Iranian money was moving around. But uh, I don't think Iran made any statement, official or unofficial, to, uh, to undermine the importance of the election or to show a, a kind of a objection to a candidate to our program. There were Iranian media and some Iranian-funded uh, media that actually tried to undermine one of the candidates. But uh, other than that, we have not seen 
much activity or much interference from Iran so far. I actually thought the Iranian, Pakistani, and U.S. position was actually remarkably similar in terms of their calculation. This is an election that's best yeah. uh, to keep an arm's length from, and lest all the you know rumors of who's backing whom. It was actually creating a great cause of confusion because for quite a while it was actually unclear who President Karzai was backing. Um, it was unclear who the Americans were backing, and of course the ultimate result is decided in Washington, not in Afghanistan, in the minds of many <laughs> uh, uh, Afghans. And, and, and so I think that was actually a cause of confusion, but by the end I think it was pretty clear that there wasn't a favorite um, uh, you know, that Washington had. And you know, I actually don't see much evidence of, of Pakistan massive support for any one candidate or Iranian support in that regard. I mean, there were there were reputation, you know, feelings of that there was money flowing. But my guess is, knowing Iran and Pakistan, they're probably backing all three of the all the potential candidates with some money in in the game. Um, but 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 ultimately, most of these people had a pretty hands off in terms of this this round. I think will be interesting if the next round is different. One more question, perhaps. Can I add to yes, sorry, yeah, I just, just want to add that um, definitely, I mean, rumors aside, uh, there's there's been money flowing uh, from diff different sides. I mean, th this has been the case for a while, whether it's to support some media or in others uh, or other outfits. Um, but what was interesting was that President Rouhani was in Kabul on March 20th or 21st for Nowruz, the new Afghan New Year, and he, uh, in his speech, uh, made a reference to occupation mm -hmm. twice. Yes, yes, and it was very badly received by the Afghan population. Yeah. I mean, there was major reaction by all sides in Afghanistan, saying, "You know, you're coming here as as a guest, and you're you you you've gone beyond your bounds." And <laughs> yeah. so. Uh, um, you know, Afghans, I think, view whether one neighbor or the other, long time ago it was the Soviets, and whoever seems to be going beyond a certain limit is always seen with suspicious, suspicion from, from the Afghan side, and, and that, that applies to Iran as well. Okay, a short question, Max. Yeah, I just have three observations which I'll make and then the group can react to them. The first is we have a saying in this country that politics makes strange bedfellows. And certainly this was the case with say, the linking of Ashraf Ghani and Dostam or with Abdullah with the person who's been in the past associated with Hekmet Yar. Mm -hmm. uh, the second is that uh, I think this election was characterized by a lot of te televised debates, which I don't think was characteristic of 2009 or 2004, mm -hmm. which were seen nationwide and mm -hmm. gave people lots to think about. I watched a few of those debates myself. And the third is uh, everything was done by a secret ballot, which meant that uh, and men and women were in different places, mm -hmm. so that uh, men had no idea how their women voted, mm -hmm. and their women had no idea how their men voted. Maybe. Uh, we don't know how things came out. Uh, so it'll be very interesting to see. Uh, Max, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, in the 9 and 10 election where I was an observer, women were separate on separate yeah. lines. Yeah, that's not that's not new. Any, any reaction here? And there's another fourth uh, observation, that the role of social media in Afghanistan, yes. particularly okay. in major cities. Yeah, yeah, social media. Well, I think we've we've come to the end of what I think you'd have to agree with me has been a very rich, detailed uh, examination of as best we can at this juncture of the election. And uh, there's a lot to hold us accountable for if we've gotten things wrong here. Uh, but uh, so I hope you'll be gentle <laughs> and that. And thank you again for coming. And uh, thank you, Lou, again for being sponsor for for events like this thank you thank you